All right. Um, thanks very much for coming. Um, I, uh, you know, the Bora Foreman lecture is obviously very important to me, but I'll, I'll tell you that the, you know, the history of it is that I had had a catastrophic illness in 2010, 2011, and it was very important for me to be able to give back and, and show thanks for uh, both to the department and the medical school, the university, the hospital, um, for really standing by me and doing everything that, you know, they could during that time. And, and uh, one of the most central figures to that was, was Jim Brink, who really was visiting at my bedside every single day when I was in this hospital uh, and, and at home during that period of time. Um, you know, I'm really thankful, you know, seven years since that time, almost exactly seven years to the day since that has been over, uh, you know, to be able to return some, some way to the university through the Bora Foreman Fund, which is now funded uh, scholarships in the School of Public Health, internships in the School of Public Health, and the Bora Foreman Lectureship, which has um, included visitors such as our 19th Surgeon General of the United States, Vivek Murthy, Zeke Emanuel, Harlan Krumholtz. For those of you that attended two months ago, we did the screening of To Air as Human here, uh, which is continuing its national tour, and we were the second place in the country basically to show it. Um, and basically, hopefully, to, uh, to shine a light on health policy issues that are relevant to those of us that are you know, practicing medicine or, in my case, also being a patient at times. Um, you know, nobody could be more important to be able to give this lecture than Jim Brink, who I've known for 28 years and has been one of my closest friends during that time. Um, I met him on my first day of my GU rotation. Uh, at uh, Wash U. It was, his, uh, it was his first year of being an attending at Wash U, and it was my first year of being a resident. And I don't think I've ever made a friend faster than, than we became friends at that time. Uh, he'd come to Wash U after already finishing his residency at um, MGH, where he was chief resident and also had done an abdominal interventional fellowship. And before that, he had grown up in Indiana and attended uh, Purdue University and uh, graduating in three years and Indiana University School of Medicine. He has been you know, honored so many times, given so many lectureships. Um, seeing him back at MGH makes me happy uh, um, in only one way, and that is that I know it was always his dream to be able to go back there and become physician in chief, radiologist in chief at MGH. And so... Um, uh, I'm happy about that, even though it has meant that he has left Yale, where he was our chair for, I think, seven or eight years and really presided over a time of uh, both turmoil and transition to great stability in our department. Um, his talk is on the future of radiology and talking about the key drivers over the next five years, and nobody uh, could be more um, ideal for giving that type of talk because of the leadership roles he has played both in the RSNA, now with the ACR, uh, in organized medicine through SCARD and, and uh, you know, all of the other organizations that really play critical roles um, in our specialty. So thank you very much for coming and sharing this with us. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howie, for what a nice introduction and what a pleasure it is to be back. Uh, I really look forward to this visit. Um, it's been five years and uh, I really was uh, telling all my new colleagues how eager I was to come back and uh, re reconnect with all of you. And so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I also, I was telling many earlier today that, you know, after you leave, you start realizing some things that were really terrific that you just didn't appreciate as much. And so maybe I'll share some of those with you as, uh, uh, at, at the end, if not before. So um, a few disclosures. Um, I don't have personal financial interest to disclose. Um, at least for four more weeks, I am chair of the board of the ACR. But I'm not counting the weeks. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, but it's uh, been a big job. There's no financial relationship with myself or with the MGA. Sometimes people think that there might be a linkage given some of the of these programs that we've contributed to the ACR from the MGH. We do have a consulting group at MGH uh, that provides consulting services to a variety of entities, but in this talk, uh, the ones that we provide to Nuance may be relevant regarding a decision support for reporting. Um, we have a data science center that does uh, artificial intelligence stuff. Uh, we have relationships with GE, NVIDIA, and Nuance, and I'll speak about some of those activities uh, as well. And so what are the key drivers? Uh, and it's always a little bit dangerous to you know, get out the crystal ball and, and imagine that you can forecast the future. So uh, uh, please don't uh, shoot me five years from now if it uh, doesn't turn out the way uh, we might think. But the, the main drivers, I think, first are payment reform. And I'll speak about um, site neutral payments and macro a little bit um, and how that segues really into a bigger topic of really uh, population health management and what we as radiologists can do to contribute to uh, that, uh, that need. 
And then finally, I'll segue from there into artificial intelligence and how uh, machine learning, deep learning, data science can really, I think, also be leveraged to help us with these first two uh, activities. So let's begin with uh, uh, site neutral payments. And um, there's a gentleman at, uh, at MGH, uh, his name is Tim Ferriss. He's very active in, uh, uh, in payment reform, payment policy, and so forth. He's now our CEO of the Mass General Physicians Organization. And although I, I think he told me once he would always deny it if I ever quoted him, what the heck, uh, you know, uh, that uh, he thought that the one way to, to cure America's ills in healthcare would, you know, if someone really implemented site neutral payments, it would eliminate a lot of the trouble. It would cause a lot more trouble because so much of our engine is floated by the, uh, the, the, uh, the benefit that, is co that comes from the uh, ability to charge uh, more at certain facilities than others. But uh, Zeke Silva, who chairs our Economics Commission at the ACR, highlights uh, the difference uh, here uh, for a, a brain MRI uh, in Texas, uh, the technical component according to the Med Medicare Physician Fee Schedule uh, for 2018 reimburses at 158 whereas uh, the uh, Methodist Texan Hospital uh, effectively 225. So you may say, well, that's not that big a difference, but on a percent basis, it actually is, isn't it? That's a pretty substantial difference uh, between a freestanding center and a hospital-owned facility. But that's government payment. Uh, what about uh, when you look at uh, private insurers? And this source comes from Amino, which shows uh, rather dramatic differences in uh, the price of uh, of uh, imaging. This is for a limb MRI, and it could cost as much as $1,500 more if taken at a hospital versus a, a freestanding imaging center. And you'll see uh, Connecticut's uh, at least above average. Massachusetts is way down here, but even still, this is something that we fear a little bit um, uh, because this would make a big difference to our ability of our hospitals to, um, to be able to make it all work. Um, I actually wrote an article about this uh, in which I I could point to a lot of different hospital services that could be affected, and the one I chose to focus on was our police and security force. You know, who pays for police and security, which in our hospital is a, is a really important function and probably is here too, but you know, the big urban hospital, this is an extremely important function, and it's, the, it's the, uh, the, the way all the economics work that helps sort of drive the, the overage, if you will, from these kind of services help allow us to pay for those kinds of services. Um, so the big bombshell happened last summer when Anthem uh, declared uh, in this policy release and in basically June 28, uh, when they made this effective, that they would no longer pay uh, for high cost imaging and hospital based uh, imaging facilities at all. In other words, complete uh, denial of payment in certain locations. Um, this was a, a big bombshell basically and effectively saying that you would need to go through their benefit manager aim to get approval for um, imaging in any hospital-based facility uh, if you're going to get, uh, get uh, high-cost imaging. Uh, and effect effectively, uh, they would only pay for what they thought was appropriate. They did provide some carve-outs, some medical necessity carve-outs for very limited conditions, um, obstetrics, perinatology, and so forth. But, you know, that was very limited. They have liberalized these a bit. They got a, a lot of uh, a criticism for it. But they didn't overturn their policy. They just simply opened up some of the, the, um, uh, the carve-outs. Um, effectively, um, they released this in some of the Midwest states in July, uh, moved to, to some of the Western states uh, and Southern states in uh, September, California in December. And here in Connecticut, uh, Maine and Virginia as recently as March 1st. Um, uh, I realized I was just chatting with Rob, has this had a big impact here? And uh, I was informed that, that really here there was, I think your health system was big enough to be able to carve out the system from being really uh, affected by this. But in many markets across the country, this is a huge, huge deal uh, because um, uh, if you're a uh, if you're an if you're the owner of an independent imaging practice, you're thrilled by this, right? Because it means that your business, your doors are just being flooded. If you work, if you're an employed physician for a hospital, it means you're being starved, and your hospital's being starved. And um, very memorable speech by Deb Dyer, who's uh, at the National Jewish in uh, in Denver, uh, talks about the impact it's uh, it's had on them since it went live in September first, being very draconian. So. Uh, this is a big deal. Um, one little tidbit to share, I suppose, is that you know when Medicare forms policy, they do it through a very uh, you know uh, formal process. The public can comment, organizations can comment. There's a formal uh, period by which you can help shape the policy. May, they may not listen terribly well, but at least we have the opportunity to help shape it. But when a private carrier implements policy, it's just released like a bombshell, and you find out about it on Ant Mini or. You know, it's not, there is no public comment period, no ability to shape the future so much. And so um, it's interesting because I think the government has been really dancing around this issue for some time. 
Uh, and in the meantime, uh, this private carrier just took the bull by the horns and said, okay, we're just going to do this. As you may know, it was also tied to some other rather draconian policies, which really raised the ire of a number of other specialties. Um, what I found most uh, egregious was the uh, ER visits. If, you're, uh, if you were deemed to be not emergent and you had an ER visit, you could be denied payment for your ER visit. So I took my 20-something-year-old to the local hospital in New Hampshire last summer when she slammed the car door in her hand by accident was screaming in pain and, you know, um, what do you, you just jump in the car and go run to the emergency room? About halfway there, I realized, well, she probably doesn't need to go because she's already, you know, you're already on your way. And, you know, if, I did, if this policy were in effect, I'd be paying for that ER visit because by the time we got there, she really didn't need to go. Okay, but maybe I should have turned around, but whatever. The point being is, this is a big deal. Now, there's also the modifier 25 piece of this, which says that um, if you're a proceduralist, you couldn't also do a same day uh, evaluation, same day as the procedure. That's been overturned as well. But our policy, the policy about imaging still stands. And the, the fact is, is that the ACR did take a very strong position on this, where we came out very, very much against it, um, feeling that this was really a, uh, a drive to commoditization of our services and a race to the bottom for, uh, for rate reimbursement, really um, a, creating an intermediary between patients and their uh, physicians, uh, forcing in, uh, patients to certain providers and denying their care at other providers that really affect our specialty. Um, we've made it very clear that we would oppose a reverse steerage policy. We're not trying to favor one practice or the other over the other, but just feel that this kind of steerage is, is, is challenging, if not just downright objectionable. Um, I like this cartoon. Effectively, the true effect is sort of saying, you know, uh, to cut costs, we've moved our clinic overseas. Please take a ticket for your flight coupon and we'll fly you to the low cost provider. Um, so where does it stand currently? Um, as I mentioned, uh, they have liberalized the list of exceptions a bit, but uh, there is a lawsuit pending in Georgia now uh, by a hospital uh, there about the policies. Um, the ACR is banded with a number of other organizations to really try and fight this through a number of uh, uh, mechanisms, either through uh, media appeals, uh, uh, letters to Congress and so forth. And I, I think that it's more to come on this issue. Suffice it to say that these are the organizations that have banded together, ranging from the emergency physicians to the radiologists to the radiation oncologists and so forth, vascular surgeons, uh, with a number of efforts at it. Um, but this is a long fight, a long uh, struggle, and I do think that I keep thinking back to Tim Ferriss's comment that this is a big deal, that if other carriers follow suit uh, and uh, this becomes a nationwide trend, it's going to just turn upside down uh, how hospitals function, how, um, how practice Im private practice uh, imaging centers function. Um, the t our advocacy timeline I won't bore you with, but suffice it to say there's a lot of effort being paid to this today. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that one of the interesting things is that um, uh, I, I wrote an article about this, uh, which I called the Hatfields, the McCoys, and Anthem's new policy for advanced diagnostic imaging, because as the chair of the board, I've never received so much hate mail in my life. Uh, over the last uh, six months, I got lots of hate mail over ACR's policy because the private, the imaging, the owners of the imaging centers were so upset that I, we would take a posture against this policy. Um, it, it's a little surprising to me that this just appeared last week that Anthem's first quarter earnings rose 30% to 1.3 billion. Uh, decline, they attribute decline in medical costs to prove its performance thanks to value-based care models. Well, okay, you know, so if that was, was that the goal? I mean, uh, is that why they're doing this? Uh, it's a little coincidental to me. Uh, but suffice it to say, it's been a real challenge to try and uh, keep uh, the, the House of Radiology together on this. One thing, an interesting tidbit, in my current job, um, the radiologists own two imaging centers, and we, one of those centers is um, in a very uh, exclusive part of Boston, which really provides a ton of margin for us. And we use that margin to support our research mission. So, um, you know, $2.5 million a year in our department flows to support the research enterprise. And that comes from the technical revenue earned at our own imaging facility. So even though it may seem like a, uh, a town gown issue, uh, at least in our gowns, this is uh, uh, important to us because, you know, the, the independent imaging facilities actually float our academic mission. Um, let's turn a little bit to macro. I'm not going to belabor this. We could spend a whole hour talking about macro and what it means for physician payment. But I want to highlight where it, where it flows to um, uh, the, um, where, where the things are heading in this model, which is really toward all, alter, alternate payment models. Uh, MIPS is effectively the new version of fee-for-service, um, but there's a real drive to push uh, practices to APMs. APMs are really about uh, um, you know, coordinating care, improving quality, and reducing costs all at the same time. 
and effectively it's rather loosely defined in the statute, but does require physicians to assume a two-sided financial risk, um, including a quality component. But this need to assume financial risk really, I think, uh, will drive the way to what are really boils down to being um, population health management uh, challenges. Um, it involves coordinating care, get, improving quality at lower cost. Um, there's a number of things that we can do to participate, um, whether they be uh, participating in bundled payments or ACOs or what have you. But suffice it to say that um, physicians are encouraged to take on this risk. They receive uh, incentive payments of 5% annually from 2019 to 2025. And big, big academic practices like this and uh, MGH as well, we're kind of immune to this because our practice plans take care of this for us. So you probably haven't been living in the macro world so much, but it's important to be aware of it because it does pave the way, I think, to the next big driver I'll get to in just a moment. Um, one tidbit is, I, I'm not sure about this practice, but at MGH, we actually are in an APM uh, as a whole group practice uh, already. But one of the challenges is that we have to have at least 25% uh, of our business, uh, Medicare business in it uh, in 2019-2020, um, but that accelerates pretty rapidly to up to 75% by 2023. And so this is one of the hardest things for us to, uh, to meet is this particular requirement. Um, there's a number of things the ACR is doing to try and um, uh, help uh, radiologists participate in APMs uh, listed here, including uh, bundled payment models uh, for uh, CT lung or mammography and so forth, stroke. Um, and some other apps that can help radiologists understand what their share of a bundle ought to be. Um, participation in registries is a big deal, and um, this is actually near and dear to your hearts because, you know, guess who is in charge of all the registries for the country? Anybody know? Jeff Weinrich. He's, uh, he's in charge of, uh, of uh, near-dear, which is the aggregation of all of the ACR's registries. As you can see in the statute, uh, it encourages use of qualified clinical data registries. Uh, NIRDIR is the National Radiology Data Registry, and it's a qualified uh, clinical data registry. There are a number of different registries available, but if you're in practice, these registries are really important to you because it enables you to participate in the quality payment program under the new payment models to be able to, um, to get paid. And uh, they include the CT colonography, mammography, lung cancer screening, the general radiology improvement database, the dose index registry, uh, and uh, the interventional radiology a registry done in conjunction with the SIR. Um, these also enable us to not just qualify for payment, but enable us to follow patients, of course, document for payment, but also um, data mine for best practice. So I encourage, even though it may not be directly tied to these issues at the moment, important to keep in mind going forward. Um, certainly, there's a drive to push people to APMs and assume that two-sided financial risk. And I won't belabor these particular details, but suffice it to say that um, the world is really pushing us to move in this direction. And uh, if you're really going to participate and assume two-sided risk, you need to do it for a whole population of patients. Uh, which brings me to the next big driver, which is population health management. And I find this particularly fascinating because five years ago when I moved to Boston, this was one of the topics that I felt really uh, was very different between working here in, in Connecticut and working in Massachusetts because it's a pretty short drive, but boy, it was a huge difference in how um, much penetration there had been. In fact, uh, each department in MGH, including the day I arrived, I was asked, uh, what are you gonna do to help with population health management, including radiology? And I ended up putting all my eggs, uh, or our department's eggs in this basket, mm -hmm. variation control. Controlling, trying to reduce variation in how we do our business. And that can occur in many different forms. Variation in what we do consequent to certain clinical conditions. What imaging do we do? What interventions do we do? What do we recommend? And so, you know, I hearken back to being an abdominal radiologist and, um, and uh, you know, we're always embarrassed about something. Everyone in this room is embarrassed about something, including myself. You know, for me, it was always the one centimeter hyperhancing nodule in the liver, right? Do we do an ultrasound? Do we do a CT? Do we do a uh, follow-up MR? Do we do it in six months? Do we do it in 12? What, what do we do? And yet there is best practice available to us, but we don't always necessarily leverage it. And as a consequence, a lot of that stuff gets done that isn't really following best practice. And so to me, this was how we could contribute most. But before I get there, let me talk a little bit more just about population health management. I needed to come up to speed uh, when I went to Massachusetts. So I turned to this uh, source, a roadmap for provider-based automation in a new era of healthcare. 
And the goal being to keep a patient population as healthy as possible, minimizing the need for expensive interventions, such as ER visits, hospitalizations, imaging tests, and so forth. Um, it requires new skill sets, new infrastructures, but a key element here is at least semi-automation, if not automation. Because there's a lot of people out there, and if we're gonna really assume two-sided financial risk for their health, those 100,000 people that we might be contracted to take care of their health, and we're gonna own risk on their health, we gotta to leverage tools to help us do that. And that's really what this means, assuming that kind of risk. Um, I can tell you that um, two-sided risk in my, at, the, at, at Partners Healthcare, we have at least almost 50% of our business on the outpatient side, on the commercial side, is in uh, uh, at-risk contracting. So it's a big, big part of our program. I'm not gonna, this is meant, not meant to you to read, but just sort of show you what it looks like. Every year we, we have something called the internal performance framework, which defines the measures by which we're gonna be measured against with our carriers. And I'm, rather than make you read it, I'm just gonna highlight the buckets, and these are the buckets. But what I find really interesting about this is that, um, I give credit to Tim Ferriss, who was the head of population health management before he got his new job. Effectively, he went to the carriers a few years ago and said, look, these are the measures we're gonna use. And he convinced them, rather than each carrier telling us what measures they're gonna measure us against. You know, one carrier wants to measure us on how many people have their diabetes under control. Another carrier wants to measure us on how many have their blood pressure under control and so forth. He said, these are the measures we're gonna propose every year. Will you accept them? Unfortunately, he, somehow he managed to get our, all of our carriers to agree to this. So we only have one set of measures we, we give to all the payers. And it changes every year based on what the drivers are that are needed. Uh, the buckets are quality and efficiency strategies, quality measures, including ambulatory and hospital quality and strategy. And then here's the big ticket one, re reducing medical expense trend. This means how fast our expense is growing uh, on an annual basis. And one really weird thing about Massachusetts is that there's been a law for a long time that says the expense can't grow more than three point something percent per year. The actual decimal point changes a little bit every year. But we're required by law that we can't let the expenses go up higher than three point something percent every year for our, the care we provide. If it does, we pay penalties to the state. Uh, and we also pay penalties to the carriers who, you know, uh, they expect us to keep the cost down. So this is the big, big bucket. And I, I put it last because I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But we can impact all three domains directly or indirectly. Let's tr first turn to just some quality and efficiency strategies. There's a variety of things we can do improving access, ambulatory access, keeping people out of the emergency room. We don't want to drive up the cost of care because that's, that's not good for us. We need to keep it under control. Uh, and thus, we really participate in an E, we call it the ED imaging avoidance program. What do we do to keep people from going to our ED just because they need an imaging exam? Um, streamline workflows to improve our capacity. Increasing page, patient engagement, social media uh, campaigns for cancer screening and even a radiology consultation clinic to try and engage patients and to help improve their own quality uh, of health. As well as increasing virtual care e-consults that can help us participate in caring for patients and keeping them out of their, their doctor's offices. Um, the urgent imaging program, I was really proud of the department for this one. Um, this, is, this sounds like the kind of slogan that a chair would come up with. The answer is yes, the question is how. I'm happy to say that it wasn't actually me who came up with this, that uh, those implementing it uh, did so. And, the whole point is just to keep people out of the ED if they, all they need is an imaging study. And by implementing this as a mechanism where we just create a phone system, you know, a person who answers the phone and really works the patient in to keep people from just out of desperation sending their patient to our emergency department. And then you see it has about a 94% benefit to the people that we've, we've rolled it out to. Um, auto protocoling, Irena and I were talking about this earlier today, that um, just to streamline throughput in the ED, we started auto protocoling a number of cases that need uh, uh, imaging, particularly uh, non-contrast CTs, which are you know, relatively easy to auto protocol. And that's made a big difference. It's dropped our uh, time to complete imaging exams by about 20% or about 20 minutes overall. We've rolled this out to almost all of our non-contrast CTs and are now looking at some of our contrast studies. Stream, streamline radiology reporting and notification. This one actually had the biggest impact. This is a tool I'm gonna to speak of a bit later. This is a decision support for reporting tool, but we, uh, I'll, I'll speak about it, what it means later, but suffice it to say that when you use this tool, it really triggers an electronic conclusion. And with that electronic conclusion, we realize we can just propagate that through a pager and allowing, notifying the referring physician in the ER that their, their results are ready. 
But look at the impact it had. It's almost embarrassing. It reduced length of stay for abdominal uh, pain patients by two and a half hours just by letting them know the results are available. Hard to imagine, right? I mean, two and a half hours is crazy, but that's what this particular project showed. So and they really like the, the, the fact that we can, you know, just trigger a page when just saying, you know, the, the turkey's done in the oven, you know? I mean, your, your results are ready, uh, come look. Um, on basic quality measures, and I know, uh, thank you, Tom, for coming today. I mean, the chief medical officer beats this drum all the time. I know uh, Peter Herbert did as well. Infection control, hand washing, and so forth. We'd have to be as big as participants as anyone else uh, in this. Uh, cancer screening rates are a big deal. So many of these carriers uh, for their two-sided risk models, what is the uh, breast cancer screening compliance rate? What is the uh, cervical cancer screening? What is colon cancer screening? And if you don't comply and you don't show that, you know, 98% of your cohort, maybe 95, is up to date with their screening, you pay penalties and the two-sided risk models. And so what can we do to help? Uh, we've taken a, a number of ways to try and help. We do text message reminders for our screening. We offer same-day breast and lung cancer screening. So if a patient is found to be a candidate for um, lung cancer screening, we offer to get them in that day, even in our homeless clinics and in our um, vulnerable populations. Uh, and even using a predictive modeling, thanks to a gentleman named Efren Flores in our department, uh, a physician who, and this is, he's very passionate about this. This is a map of the Bo Boston sits here. This is uh, Charlestown, Revere, Chelsea. You can see that um, we can see who's most likely to miss their appointments based on various uh, socioeconomic factors. And then hopefully plan interventions to help with this. Um, I can tell you that the interventions are a little bit uh, more challenging. Uh, we're working on a, uh, we have a van that goes back and forth to Chelsea every day to shuttle patients uh, for radiology, and we're looking to try and let that van go pick up the more vulnerable patients from their homes and bring them to, to some of our imaging centers. The primary care physicians love this because at the moment, they feel like they own the entire uh, burden of getting their patients cared for. And these are imaging studies, and the more that we, even if you help them a teeny bit, they just love it, you know? I mean, um, and we should. So the more we can do to help, the better. But here's the big nugget, reducing medical expense trend. How do we help keep the cost of care down for this population and keep it in line? Um, there's a variety of things, imaging import and interpretation. I understand since I've, uh, I've, I've left, uh, you all do it, bring in studies and interpret them from outside, is that right? Which is great, and uh, we do the same. It avoids uh, rep repeating examinations, improves care coordination. Uh, risk coding and documentation is a bit esoteric. It's using imaging to help predict uh, future risk and uh, expense. I love this one, out-of-network utilization management. And in Boston, we have a lot of trouble with patients leaking to carriers outside of Partners Healthcare. Our big competitor is Shields MRI up there. And um, how do we, you know, if they do leak and go to their, these places, we pay twice in a way. We pay for their imaging because we, we own their imaging costs. We also pay because they don't use our decision support systems to help keep utilization uh, appropriate. Um, and that brings me to appropriateness and variation reporting and control. And I'll talk about two tools, shared decision-making for interventional procedures, and then decision support both before and after imaging. Let me talk about shared decision-making first, because I find this one particularly, oh, in just a second, this is uh, out-of-network, limiting out-of-network uh, utilization, and I, I'm a little embarrassed to be so uh, uh, sticking it to my competitors, but these are their ads, okay? So when a day at the beach becomes a pain in the neck, get a Shields MRI, an MRI for Christmas, what to expect? Price shopping and transparency tools. Shoveling injuries, will I need an MRI? Hitting the pavement, beware of those extra miles. MRI and jumper's knee, what you need to know. Reminder, you have only so many days you use your flexible spending account, get an MRI. I mean, it is just Charlotte of this thing, isn't it? I and mean, this is our competitor up there, so I mean, it's just embarrassing. Uh, that's, and again, we, when they go to this competitor, we pay twice, we pay uh, for the, uh, um, uh, the cost of the care, but we also may pay the penalties if it exceeds our, our, uh, our cost limits. Shared decision-making for interventional procedures. I particularly am excited about this. Um, I've been beating the drum a bit. It hasn't caught on at the ACR. Uh, I think it has a little bit more chance at SIR than at ACR, but I got, I got so excited because one of my jobs at the moment is I'm the um, interim director of the vascular center. Uh, the head of the vascular center at MJH went to become president at Newton Wellesley Hospital and they asked me to be the interim director which means it includes vascular surgery and vascular medicine and interventional radiology and endovascular neurosurgery and all those things. And one day I was sitting there and all of a sudden I got an email with my uh, shared decision-making scores for a carotid endarterectomy for the quarter. And I'm going, oh, 
well, what, what is that about? I, I knew about, I'd heard about the system called Proe, and it, it's not a great name, uh, procedure order entry, very uncreative name. But it was built and modeled after ROE, which is radiology order entry. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But the way it works is there's a bunch of procedures, and I've blown it up here to show you, for which they've built out guidance for shared decision making. Um, total hip arthroplasty, total knee arthroplasty, hysterectomy, weight loss surgery, incisional repair, hernia repair, and so forth. And there's one germane to radiology, vena cava filter placement. So if you want to order, uh, order, if you're planning or considering the idea of getting a total knee uh, arthroplasty, you can click on this uh, website or the, go to this tool, link on it, and it'll bring up a, a series of questions. These are actually the ones for IVC filter placement you know, active bleeding, and you pick your, your problem, you pick your comorbid factors, you know, other comorbidities and so forth, and it gives you a risk score. It doesn't give you a number, which I, I appreciate. It just says, rarely appropriate, maybe appropriate, appropriate, based on the guidance. Looks a lot like uh, radiology decision support, but it's for procedures or, or surgeries. And um, I thought this was terrific. It also can generate a smart consent form, embedding the actual risks of the procedure in the consent form. Uh, we don't do it for IVC filter replacement, but some of the other surgeries we do. Uh, but this was my, what came to me that day was this uh, graph showing me these are the times that the, the shared decision-making tool had been consulted for carotid endarterectomy. And I looked and I said, well, what happened to these poor people? You know, two people consulted this tool and they actually got a red zone score for their, did they get a carotid endarterectomy or what happened? So I asked our quality lead for that uh, vascular center to investigate and um, suffice it to say that um, appropriate care was delivered here um, without getting into the details, but um, it was a, really a, quite a fascinating tool to me. And one that I really believe is sort of the next generation of decision support is, is guiding uh, practitioners even to know if they should refer a patient to a vascular surgeon or to a, 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 special, a, special, a specialty proceduralist if you're a primary care physician. So more to come on that. I've, I've been uh, beating the drum at the ACR about building more guidance for procedures. I must say I didn't quite succeed, um, uh, but I do think it may have some more traction at SIR, and I think this is, again, the way of the future. Hari Pandarapandi, who works in our department, I think summarized this whole topic very nicely when it comes to why do we need to manage utilization for population health management. If we underutilize our services, population health declines because people are deprived of the benefits of imaging. If we overutilize our services, costs go up, and even um, comorbid conditions or you know, false positives may drive a little bit of a decrement in health benefit because of overutilization. And so the key is to find that sweet spot of appropriate utilization where we're really optimizing benefit while reducing cost. And we do that um, through um, two efforts, two efforts that really are guiding appropriate use at the front end of the imaging chain uh, as imaging tests are contemplated and being considered. And at the back end of the imaging chain, when we report our cases, and uh, what, more importantly, what we recommend consequent to the findings that we detect. I'm going to begin with decision support for referring physicians. Um, I had a nice conversation with Irena and Madsen Wallach earlier today about this. I realize this is a challenging topic. It's a difficult system to really get right. Um, but I'll, let me share with you uh, MGH's experience with this just to, to share it um, and why I think it's important. Uh, first, uh, this was in Consumer Reports a couple years ago. Uh, so he's saying that you, know, you should question CT scans and x-rays uh, because roughly a third of them do little if any medical purpose. And this was an oft-quoted non-statistic a few years ago. Everyone was quoting this statistic, even though it was based on absolutely no data. Uh, I think David Brenner put it in an article on radiation. And he, 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 it was, he was just guessing, you know. So nonetheless, we were under quite a lot of uh, scrutiny for the appropriateness of what we do. At MGH back in 2004, they implemented a decision support system you know, creatively named ROWI, Radiology Order Entry. Uh, something a little more uh, exciting might have been helpful, but uh, they did it because that was when RBM started requiring pre-authorization for high-cost imaging. Um, and effectively, they said, you know, rather than do a pre-authorization, what if we build a system that does the same thing and provides decision support in our new, at a brand new order entry system, computerized order entry system, and they turned to the ACR appropriateness criteria to enable the content or bring in content to that system, which as you know, sort of takes the, the, the uh, domain credibility of a wide variety of uh, practitioners, including non-radiologists, and makes the, the guidance available at the point of care when imaging tests are being contemplated. Effectively, the appropriateness criteria, as you know, existed for many years. Those of us who are older remember when it came in a big book, you know, you get this big book in the mail, then they got them on a CD and you get a few CDs in the mail, and now it's all online. 
Um, but because it was uh, potentially electronically consumable, um, converting these analog pages to uh, electronic content that could be then embedded into an order entry system enabled systems like this, which was the ROE system, basically. If you picked an exam and then signs and symptoms and diagnoses, uh, you would get an appropriateness score back. It's not ideal. It's sort of like a GPS that says, okay, it puts a number on all the roads ahead. This, this road might be good. This road might be bad. You know, I mean, it's not perfect, but at least it, it, it was something. Um, the, uh, the use of the system persisted for about five years. They published the results uh, showing that uh, the rise of high cost imaging trend, the thing that we're trying to control was flattened, coincident with the use of decision support, uh, a pattern that was also shown in Minnesota uh, with a flattening of that growth curve um, when uh, you know, significant savings when decision support was used as an alternative to radiology benefit managers for high cost imaging. So why Massachusetts and Minnesota? Why did, why did both of these uh, states succeed in getting a gold card for pre-authorization using these systems? Anybody <clears throat> know? Mostly because these are two states in the union that, that really dominate by local insurance carriers. That um, you know, this, the companies I'll show you in a few minutes that do about 50% of our, our business are kind of local to Massachusetts. And, and, as a, and the same is true in Minnesota. When I was here at Yale, I, with Howie's help, we tried to get Troy Brennan's company, which one was that, Aetna? You know, tried to get them to agree to uh, waive the gold card, and they finally did very grudgingly on a pilot basis, but we didn't get the system in place, and so it never really took off. But it was like, they had to pull teeth to try and get Aetna to agree to that. So I grant you that the national payers, are, it's tough to, to succeed with this. I wanted to show you, though, how important um, this is to our practices at Yale, excuse me, at MGH. Yes, but, <laughs> no, I have to tell you, I've done the same, made the same mistake I did in Boston, so uh, I, I blushed both times, so hard to break old habits. And, um, so this is a, a newsletter, your primary concern that goes to all the primary care practices. This is back in 2014, about a year after I got there. Sort of alerting all the primary care docs, they're going to get their ROE red, red rate. Because all we really care about is how often do people order in the red zone? All the other numbers aren't so important. Um, and they're basically telling them your, your ROE score is coming, you know, put your seatbelt on, that it's not meant to be judgmental or, or punitive. We do publish uh, all the primary care groups, their red rate uh, publicly. And you can see when this first came out, the Bullpinch Medical Group had a pretty high red rate. Uh, the Waltham Group, uh, by the way, where Bill Mayo Smith's wife is the, um, is the lead uh, primary care doctor. They're, they're the, had the lowest red rate. Um, but it, you know, it was interesting. I went to one of the meetings where the CMO, the Tom's equivalent, sits with each primary group to show them their red rate of ordering. And um, it was interesting because um, before the meeting started, he pulled one of them aside and said, you know, do you mind if I show you, I'm gonna show everyone's data, but yours is a little bit on an outlier. Do you mind me showing it? And she said, no, that's fine. You know. So the individual scores went up and you know, she was way out on the red zone, much more than her colleagues. And you know, she was, everyone was you know, kind of shocked and she said, you know, I missed an ovarian cancer diagnosis a few years ago. I think I had changed my threshold. So effectively, she was ordering CTs on anybody who walked in with abdominal pain. Um, and, you know, it's sort of, and they didn't even know it in their own practice because they cover for each other on weekends. They don't really get into the weeds of each other's patients. And so actually having um, uh, that information was very, actually very uh, fruitful. Another tip I'll share is that another, because it's been so ingrained in the culture there that um, patients ask, what does decision support say? Uh, the head of uh, quality and safety was telling me uh, that um, you know, she was talking to a patient once in her office and uh, having a difficult time convincing the patient she did not need a lumbar spine MRI. He has a little back pain and the patient really wants an MRI. You know, I don't think you need it. And she finally turned the screen on her, on her desk to show the patient, look, here's our decision support thing. It says you don't need MRI. And, you know, she says, now these patients come and say, well, what does decision support say? And they use it as a, as a shared decision-making tool, which is really what this is about. So um, I've, I've been impressed by how much it's been adopted by the culture. I've also seen, I, didn't, I don't show it in this particular talk, that the red rate has gone. Um, most of the time when you turn it on, it's usually in the 5 to 6% range uh, if, on a gross average basis. But um, at MDH, it's about the 1.1 to 1.2, 1.8% range. Uh, granted, some people may say, are people just getting around it by ordering, you know, they know how to get around it. I don't know. I, d I think it's so well accepted by now that people seem to, to like it. Um, many departments have chosen to use it for their OPPE measure, which is something we didn't even ask them to do, um, but it's an easy statistic to use, and they, um, they, they set an OPPE criteria if their red rate threat was more than 10% and they had more than 10 exams, uh, then they would fail OPPE. And, 
uh, endocrinology, infectious disease, primary care, rheumatology, and neurology all chose to use their ROE red rate for their OPPE measure, which is kind of interesting. Four of them failed. That meant they went to purgatory. I mean, FPPE, you know, and uh, I'm happy to say they're rehabilitated out on the streets. Um, uh, ordering, a, ordering again, uh, you know, fully, fully well. Um, and the last tidbit, of course, is that one of the huge benefits for us has been the fact that we are gold carded for pre-auth. Anyone who uses the system doesn't have to get a pre-auth for these studies. And uh, this is uh, Harvard Pilgrim, Tufts, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. These are our three local payers who gave us the gold card. It represents about 50% of our commercial outpatient business. So um, that's a huge benefit for us is that uh, we don't, and, and this system is just to show how we pass the information to these payers. Now I'm the first to admit, ACR Select is not perfect. I know there's been challenges, that's an understatement. You know, actually implementing it, ACR Select I should say is the, the commercial embodiment of what was ROWI. And even we struggle with ACR Select. We implemented it when we turned on Epic about a year or two ago. It's not as robust as ROWI was. We're working hard both at the ACR and at MGH, both nationally and locally to make it uh, more robust. I will say though that the one thing I wanna emphasize at this point is that it's part of a suite called Care Select, which includes the option to bring in guidance from the pedi pediatric radiology, from the American College of Cardiology, SNMMI, uh, NCCN, choosing wisely and so forth. And so I'd really encourage um, any group that's going to be doing decision support to look at all of these for guidance, not just ACR Select. And the one in particular that I really think is important to adopt is NCCN, because their guidance for cancer is vastly superior to ACR's guidance. And just to show that comparison, the ACR guidance, we score maybe 320 scored indications for 22 cancers, 143 we left unscored because NCCN does it, and it was just overwhelming to why reinvent the wheel for everything. And also our purposes are limited to pretty much staging and diagnosis as in the full appropriateness criteria. Whereas NCCN has over a thousand indications, 51 cancer types, but more importantly, the purpose for the examination goes beyond just screening and diagnosis to include staging, treatment response, assessment, as well as follow-up surveillance. So depending on what the patient's, why the patient's getting the scan has different guidance available. And if you're gonna be doing any cancer imaging like everybody does, I'd really uh, point to NCCN and encourage you to use it. This is from their uh, website um, as an example, cervical cancer stage 1A or 1B disease versus stage two, three, or four, and it shows um, different recommendations for follow-up imaging, MRI six months after surgery, these uh, exams three to six months after completion of therapy and so forth. So it's just much more granular than the ACR guidelines and we're very happy to defer to them. Personally, I find when I'm giving a talk like this, if there's any other practitioner besides a radiologist in the audience, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to try and sell decision support if it's not all about the ACR or all about radiologists. Let's turn to the other side of the coin, which is decision support for our end of the imaging chain, where, where we're doing our business. Decision support for radiologists is really known as computer-assisted reporting. And it enables us to embed care algorithms into our point of care um, where we do our business. The idea being that if we apply the same algorithms to the same imaging scenarios, then variation in what we do, most importantly what we recommend, will be re reduced. And back to my example of the one centimeter hyper enhancing nodule in the liver, you know, at least uh, in practices I've been in, is it the ultrasound follow up CT, MR, six month, one year, you know, I mean, there's guidance to follow for that stuff but it's hard to get practices to really adopt the guidance and use it. And that's what this tool is about. Um, I give big credit to my colleagues before I got there. In 2011, they published this paper to show the sort of the, um, uh, the proof of concept of the idea, which is really to enable us to better comply with best practice or recommendations. Um, use of the tool was shown by Michael Liu at MGH to improve compliance with, say, the a lung nodule recommend uh, guidance for follow-up uh, from about 50% compliance to over 95% when the tool was made available at the point of uh, when we are practicing. The first thing I'll say though is if you know what you're doing, you don't need to use this, and you probably shouldn't, it'll slow you down. But this particular paper was about abdominal radiologists when they find lung nodules at the chest bases, what to do with those. They don't, they're not chest radiologists, what do they do with them? And they use the guidance to make sure they know what they're doing. If you do know what you're doing, don't bother, with, you know, do, do your job and do it well. But it's just a nice crutch for people in the emergency room and otherwise practicing outside of their unusual comfort zone. 
And we've even, it's been picked up by a, a commercial entity and now and even natural language processing has been added so that even if you don't decide to click the button that says guidance, they may recognize that you said there's an intrahepatic lesion on a CT scan and it says relevant guidance is available, click here for liver lesion on CT guidance and it'll bring up this window. And in this first iteration, you pick the features of your, of your finding. It suggests language, you can import all of it or pieces of it by clicking these little buttons here. And the most important thing is really the recommendation so that we standardize what we recommend consequent to what we find. That's reducing variation that should improve the health of the pod. Find that sweet spot of appropriate utilization for population health management in our two-sided risk contracts. And you can see you can bring that language into your report. <clears throat> I was so excited about this that I'm, I asked our department to build more guidance and build it fast. You know, no, just kidding. Uh, um, and basically each division, each section was asked to build more guidance. And the nice thing about um, the Mass General Physicians Organization is that it actually provides a quality bonus to every uh, practitioner who participates in quality measures. And as a department, we're allowed to, to decide what those quality measures are and we have to propose them every other quarter. So we proposed, uh, and for the past couple of years, all of our measures, have, most of them have been about building this system. But I wanna highlight for you the one that the musculoskeletal radiologist chose to build, which was pretty ambitious. Lumbar spine degenerative disc disease evaluation. I mean, that's not trivial, right? I mean, that's a big deal. That's a lot of exams and trying to build guidance for interpreting those things, not easy. So that's what they set out to do. And here's their first pass at it. This is the prototype system. The one I showed you is the production system. Um, so you now God help you if you're using it because it would take you forever to do this on a real case, but at least would help you both learn and make sure you know what you're doing. So you pick the level where you're, if you have trouble at L45, you pick the level, you, you pick the buttons that show whether you have uh, marrow edema, and then all these features are here, disc degeneration, contra bulge, you're picking the, the words that correspond. And as you're picking these things, a report is building before your very eyes, grammatically correct. It took my breath away when I first saw this thing. I mean, it's just shocking that they were able to make it, build this you know, grammatically correct thing that matches all these, these buttons. But our musculoskeletal guys say, you know, it's a little crazy, all these words, why not just have pictures? Because the picture's worth a thousand words and you know, we could certainly show what moderate disc disease looks like. And if it looks, your disc looks like that, pick that picture. And if the disc is looking like this one, pick that picture. And if the, uh, the uh, osteophytes and, um, and the facet joints look like this, pick this. The nerve root looks like it's being smushed that bad, pick that one. And you know, why pick words, pick pictures even the stenosis and the recesses and so forth, and, and you basically get the same thing. You get war and peace uh, of a report. You know, I mean, in, it's a bit anachronistic, right? Because you've just picked all these beautiful pictures that show what the problem is, and it's generated this extremely complicated report that forces the rearing physician to go back and decipher it and recreate all those pictures in his or her head, which is another issue. But my main point is at the moment is, this is uh, actually helping standardize what we do and enabling us to practice more uniformly if you need it. So I want to digress now, and I'll come back to this example in a few moments. I want to digress to um, the third main driver for the next five years, which is artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, deep learning, and the broad field of clinical data science. And we'll come back to that example in a moment. <clears throat> so um, as you know, certainly by now, um, this picture matching game we're talking about leverages what I like to refer to as our biologic pattern recognizer, i.e. our brains, right? Our brains are the ones doing this picture matching game. And effectively, it's doing it by leveraging a bunch of cortical columns. There's 100 million cortical columns, each with about 100 neurons, and those form neural networks that do this association. Uh, when we trained our brain as, uh, as infants, we learned things such as that this picture of a dog is a dog, and we understand that 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 picture matches that concept. Um, we leverage the neurobiology and the neurochemistry at the synaptic level, even the electrons and the neurochemicals that flow at the synapses to do that encoding of picture to concept. But what if we actually were to um, replace the biologic network with a artificial neural network using graphic processing units that do linear algebra to recreate that biologic network as an artificial neural network that does the same thing. Uh, that's certainly possible. That's what this whole field is about, such that we can actually train an artificial neural network to understand uh, pictures, sounds, uh, data, 
to generate objects, uh, understandings of objects, people, concepts, and diseases is the, the idea. Um, this is, a, by, by now you'd have to kind of be living under a rock not to have heard about this, but the, the bottom line is, is that this is growing extremely rapidly. At RSNA this past year, there was a Bone Age competition where 70 Bone Age algorithms were being evaluated. Uh, we did one at MGH that's in use in our pediatric, rating room, pediatric radiology reading room uh, today, which effectively we trained on a bunch of Bone Age radiographs, and that's effectively taking an untrained network and spinning the weightings of those uh, networks to uh, maximize the diagnostic yield, which is at about 93% uh, for one, within one year. It's not meant to replace this. It's them, the, the way this works is it brings up the one that it thinks is the one that matches most closely, and it brings up the two on either side of it, and you get to pick which one. But there's a video that I, I won't show today in which the pediatric radiologist actually liked the one to the left. Uh, it was uh, not exactly the one uh, right now, but it speeds this up, right? It's an efficiency improver, a precision improver as well. And so let's go back to our example now. This is our uh, lumbar spine MRI we were talking about, the picture matching game I was explaining. What if we train a neural network for each of these features that I had mentioned, right? So rather than doing the picture matching game yourself, what if there's a neural network trained to find this degeneration at L4-5, facet joint osteoarthritis at L2-3, such that as we're generating the images as they're coming off the scanner, these, these work instantaneously and populate a database of imaging findings as the images are coming off the, uh, off the scanner. Now the problem is, is that there's gonna be a ton of imaging findings, right? Because you and I know we filter we, have felt, we apply filters every time we read cases because you gotta, you gotta see the forest for the trees or whatever, for trees, for whatever, you get the idea, right? I mean, it's a, you know, it's a real, that's part of what we do is to not get, you know, but there's gonna be a ton of findings because let's face it, we all get more and more findings as we get older. But nonetheless, that's what's gonna happen is we'll be generating this three-dimensional database of imaging findings coincident with the generation of the images themselves. Um, our Center for Data Science at MGH, which, uh, by the way, Mark Michalski directs, and you all know Mark, he trained here, um, effectively, uh, in the last six months, has made enormous progress on this particular project. Uh, they have uh, trained algorithms that find the spine, reconstruct true axials through its disk space, quantify central stenosis as well as foraminal stenosis, enabling at least those parts of that report that automatically generates to populate. But there's more here than just that. This is just to show the full report that would be generated but um, I'm telling you, this is moving so fast. And just since, since RSNA, they built that much. If you go back to the list of features, that's about half of them. I mean, stenosis starts here. It's all these bottom ones. So they're down to here. They just have to fill in this top. I talked to the 30-year-old kid, I call him a kid, who's working on this project. Um, you know, at this rate, are you going to be done by January? He goes, maybe not Jan. But if you want me to be done by January, I'll make it. It's like, no, no, you know, it's okay. <laughs> But I mean, that's how fast this is coming. And so our lives are gonna be turned upside down as these uh, tools become available. They're not gonna replace this because to replace this, they may replace this in certain things in 50 years, 20 years, I don't know. But this kind of thing is gonna be a diagnostic adjunct and we'll need to adapt to it. So how do we fit into the equation here? So effectively, if the scans are coming off the scanner, the features are being detected by these algorithms, at least it'll help us improve quantification because as it detects features, it can measure them and pre-populate measurements of things. It'll feed those features to clinical pathways, the guidance, the Fleischner criteria for lung nodules or the incidental loma papers from the ACR, the algorithms that come in those papers. Those are also electronically consumable. And that guidance can then pre-populate reports and hopefully with images rather than the war and peace that I showed you before because God knows it's time to move past generating complex language and making our referring physicians decipher it when we could actually put the pictures in the report. Our job will be to filter all those findings and make sure that what is being concluded from the study leverages our understanding of anatomy, disease, and uh, medicine. At the, noon, at the morning conference this morning, I went through a talk that's mostly about abdominal anatomy, um, subtle anatomy, ligaments, mesenteries, and so forth. And uh, the residents who were there will uh, attest, I think, to the fact that we have to do a lot of abstract thinking, even anatomically. I actually told our data science team yesterday, I'm not sure that I'd pick PE detection as the first one of the first chest uh, studies because there's a lot of abstract thinking in PE detection. Is it volume averaging with a adjacent lymph node or not, and so forth. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's something that it could come soon, but I'm not sure it's the one I would go to at the very get-go. Uh, so anything that requires abstract thinking on our part, in general, I think it'll be slower to come, and that's really where we can leverage our, our expertise. We also recognized as we built the um, Data Science Center at MGH uh, that we needed some help on the back end. There's a lot, this is a big, big topic. It's one thing to train, do the usual stuff, which is define use cases, curate data, annotate data, train algorithms and implement it clinically. That's in our domain, but there's a lot of other stuff that needs to be addressed, both in uh, standards, regulatory issues, legal, ethical issues. And we decided that we need an honest broker organization like DACR to take that on. And so we created the Data Science Institute uh, about one year ago. And in the last year, we made a, a lot of progress. Um, I'm happy to say sort of building on the experience at the ACR and quality and safety and standards. Excuse me, I mean to jump. Uh, really making sure that we stay at the forefront of this and that we can help shape the future rather than having it shape our future, so to speak. Um, suffice it to say that it's about ensuring our value as AI evolves, protecting our patients from uh, tools that aren't so great. So an interesting example is um, one of the studies that our data science center did recently is uh, they just evaluated three commercially available lung nodule detection algorithms that are available, FDA approved and available today. They took a data set and they just tested them against that data set. Two performed pretty well, you know, 80 to 90% sensitivity specificity. And again, if it's a diagnostic aid, that's pretty good. But one that is FDA approved performed terribly, you know, in the 30% range for sensitivity and horrible specificity, and yet it's FDA approved. And so we need a lot more um, uh, effort paid to knowing whether a tool is gonna to be worth buying or is it uh, one of those tools that got through this regulatory system, but won't be translatable to your environment. Because that's part of the challenge is how do we avoid bias in the training sets that enable us to make sure that they're gonna be broadly applicable. Even the bone age radiograph thing, those bone age, the Grulich and Pyle cases are a bunch of middle age middle, or middle class kids from, I forget which city it is, right? You know, so what if there's differences in bone age among different populations, different uh, parts of the world? I mean, who knows? And no one's ever looked at it, so to my knowledge. Um, educating radiologists and, and other physicians are all of our stakeholders, of course, will be key. Um, Keith Dreyer, who's our, uh, my vice chair for informatics at MGH, is also the data science officer for, the, uh, for this entity. Bib Allen, the former chair of the board, is the chief medical officer. You may say, why Bib? You know, Bib is, has no domain expertise in this space, but Bib is the perfect guy for this. He's in a seven-man group in rural Alabama. They don't need the chair of radiology at MGH telling them how, to, how AI should be used in their practices. They need Bib telling them, right? And Bib is perfect for this. So I'm so happy he's our chief medical officer. And Geraldine McGinty, who is the next uh, chair of the board at the ACR, I'm happy to report, is also the first uh, woman chair to, woman to chair the board, that uh, chairs the advisory group within the, this uh, institute. Uh, the institute really is about bringing input in from a broad range of stakeholders. I, I should say the advisory work group is. And so those are, I think, are the key drivers for the next five years. Um, I do think the future of radiology is extremely bright. It's about really um, leveraging these tools. You know, an interesting quote from Kurt Langlotz, uh, who tweeted uh, some time ago, I love this quote that said, you know, how's it go? Um, Radiologists are unlikely to be replaced by machine learning, but those who use machine learning are more likely to replace those who don't, right? It's a tool that can improve our efficiency and our precision. We should embrace it and... Uh, move, uh, advance the care we provide to our patients with it. Thank you very much for your attention.